yeah, it took a bit, but hey, we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, guys. It took me a while. That's all right. Hey, no, no, we're thrilled. This is this is really cool. We've been wanting. Uh, I, I told Robin that you had been a, a an actual pilot in the Royal uh, Navy. That's right. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we wanted to go through that story and how any of that um, brought you into Star Wars and all that wonderful stuff. If that's okay. Absolutely. Well, flying flying military aircraft and X-wing, it's is exactly the same. So I can. <laughs> right. All right. So before we go, uh, did you are you hearing us okay? Is everything good on your end? We're good. Yeah, absolutely. Hearing you both fine. All Beautiful. Right. And Robin, you're gonna record so we can use this elsewhere. We are recording live right now. Awesome. awesome. Right. Just as you said, we're live, not recording now. I'm just messing around with my room. So. <laughs> oh no! It actually looks. Good. I love the X-wing in the background. Perfect. Oh yeah. Yeah. The. Um, That's amazing. So someone, huh? This guy called um, uh, Kenneboy on uh, Instagram. I think he, you know, he makes models and makes mm -hmm. and basically he made a. Um, I don't know if you can read, but he. Oh, it's so even got a little plaque. Yeah, yeah. Red, that's red. Is that Red Seven? It's Red Seven. So basically, what he did is he got the um, the colours from some of the Royal Navy aircraft. Yeah. And because Red Seven's not. Um, I think the X-wing is seen in the in the New Hope, but there's mm -hmm. a, there's a droid. There was a, a a black droid that was a oh, wow. not that wasn't sort of um, assigned to any of the call signs. So he was like, "Okay, I'm going to use that one, and that's going to be Red Seven's droid." So the Red Se you know, that that black droid in A New Hope is now Red Seven's. Oh, obviously, that's not official. <laughs> oh yes, yes, that's that's head cannon. Yes, <laughs> we're fine with that though. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons I'm so drawn to the uh, the pilots in any of the films is you all seem like, I mean, pardon me, normal people that we would run into. You know, at, you're obviously not Harrison Ford, but Harrison Ford didn't didn't fly for the Royal Navy either. You know what I mean? So, but you're you're somebody that we could run into, and and that's just I think the point of those scenes in the movies is that these were normal people yeah. fighting against oppression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you, get, the, you get the feeling. Um, it, it's, it's kind of weird. I have to say it's kind of weird because um, the, uh, uh, you know, so you sometimes find yourself talking about it as though you're actually immersed in the, the Star Wars world because... The set was so realistic, well, especially in Rogue One. You know, it was it was shot in such a way that was so realistic that the moment you were donning your your uniform or your you know your flight suit and you're you're in the Yavin base, I mean, it just looked. I mean, that your your backdrop behind you. I mean, it just looked exactly as you would imagine. You felt like you were there because even like two stories up, where the or two or three stories up, where the camera's never going to go, the art department had had made it so you had this moss growing on the damp walls of the of the base. I mean, you could go right up to it and swear that it was the actual thing. It was so realistic. So, uh, yeah, forgive me if I start talking about it in, in sort of real terms. Um, it's because it felt so realistic, which... I, my guess is that you're you're not unlike most fans, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, t t you know, I was, I was born in 72, so I was a... I was ripe for the films, you know, when I was when I was growing up. So, um, yeah, I was a, a fan anyway. So, you know, it doubled the experience. Um, yeah, none of it was was lost on me, or the importance of it wasn't lost on me at all. Right, and I imagine Ben too. Like just being on the set of Rogue One. I mean, here at Brick City Blockade, we've talked to so many people who have been behind the scenes on Rogue One. We have our good friend Details, who was doing some screen capturing stuff. He was doing yeah. behind the scenes work. Uh, I've talked with uh, Ingvig Delia, who did, of course, Princess Leia uh, at the end of the uh, movie itself. And every single conversation, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, is their interactions with Gareth Edwards, no matter how long they were, were on that fan level. That Gareth was just as much of a fan of this universe as anybody else there. It was really like a real fan experience 
for every member of this project. Am I, am I correct in thinking that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you felt it. I, I think from the moment you understood that he, he didn't want, I mean, or this is my interpretation of, of the, the film and it seemed that way through the process when I saw it, that, um, you know, they just wanted it as realistic as possible. And he, whenever he could, he was just grabbing cameras and immersing himself in the action. You know, that direct, and there's, there's no right or wrong way for the directors to work. It's just how, you know, how they work. Um, and they have their own unique way of doing it. But he was very much on the filming of this, was just getting involved in it. You know, because clearly he... He loved it and they knew from the or we all knew from the start that that was it you know it was it was being filmed by a um by a fan right. um himself and it, it showed the whole you know the whole process from as i said from the art department um you know and the, the costumes the down to the minutest detail were absolutely as a fan would want it and and that's because i think you know he'd driven that right from the start so that's a good point. I mean, you, so, you just brought up so the ben, art uh, part too. I'll be writing for uh, mickeyblog.com. Oh, sorry. I over no, talked no. over Robin. Sorry about that, Robin. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's all I was going to say was uh, Ben just brought up such a great part about the art department. They never get enough credit for some of the work they do. They get that little bit in the crawl, and then maybe they'll be recognized by Lucasfilm off to the side for such great work. But from a fan's perspective, I mean, they just pour their 100% into every part of this universe. And I imagine yeah. the reactions were amazing. Absolutely. And, and um, you, when you're watching the film, it's like anything when you don't notice it, it's like music or sound, you know, the sound mix, you know, it's not just the, the, the music that you hear, but the, um, everything about the sound design of a film. If you don't notice it, it's because they've done such a brilliant job. And it's the same thing about um, something like the art department or even costume. You know, you think you, you give credit to costume when they've got some kind of um, period drama and lots of frills and huge dresses. And, but, you, you know, in, in most films, it's so subtle and you're not noticing it. I mean, obviously Star Wars is kind of different because it's such a, a, a unique and different universe. But um, yeah, art department and the costume and, and hair and makeup and just everyone, they care, the fans of the film. And, and, and subsequent films as well. I think people sometimes, um, as you know, Star Wars fans can, I don't say judgmental, but maybe they... You know, they That's the word. That's the word. A little pickle. <laughs> Strong opinion, which is great because they care so much and rightly so. But um, you know they should they should be all they should all rest assured that the you know every person in the film they want it to be the best film there is. You know no one sets out making a film to be anything other than the best they can do, and that's across the board. So um, yeah, this was no exception, um, and uh, yeah, it showed. It was, we, I don't want to say lucky, but you know being involved in in that film. Um, we were fortunate because no one knew that that first standalone film, you know, it was going to be the first of the new, the new films. No one had any idea how that was going to turn out. And um, for, for Gareth to have shouldered, you know, that, that burden of responsibility uh, so well <laughs> was, was amazing. Yeah. Testament to him and, and, and everyone involved. Now, Ben, uh, I want to say that when we last talked a couple, three years ago, you had said that actually watching the trench run and watching the pilots in Star Wars had sort of put you on a path, or at least in small ways, put you on a path to joining uh, the Navy and being a flyer yourself. Is, is there any, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can't help but be inspired as a, as a kid. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that I saw it and said that's it that's what i want to go and do but you sh you know you it sits with you that that there's something kind of cool about you know guys just uh doing something for a cause that they believe in um that they feel that they some not you know they might have a choice they might not others they feel that this is their duty or for whatever reason that they're they're, they're doing their thing there's a bit of that but mainly it's just pilots running out to their aircraft and scrambling to launch it's just like hey they, they just look they look so cool and um yeah it just sort of in the back of your mind you you just kind of uh, you can't help but get in, inspired and kind of uh, you know stirred by that so when i eventually 
you know, was thinking what to do with my life and my life's taken sort of very different turns. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it was definitely an inspiring factor in the, uh, in wanting to, to, to fly for sure. Excuse me. Cheers, by the way, guys. Hey. Oh, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit later. I like the way you say yet. <laughs> yeah. That is the key word, yeah. It's happening, whatever. Where? You, uh, one of the, the coolest things, um, I grew up uh, not only with Star Wars, but also Top Gun, and I remember pictures of Tom Cruise walking away from his F-14, and you have pictures of you walking either toward or away from an X-wing and an actual uh, helicopter on Earth. That's and, yeah. That's, um, I um I think I posted it on um on Instagram. I've, I've got a not that yeah. I, I'm not mega active on it, but I posted a picture that yeah. I found this uh you know the flight suit's not that different. You know if the if the flight suit had been orange, it's just like that's kind of feels. Thing. Yeah, it was really yeah. it was weird. It was um I hadn't really. I hadn't really clocked how um, you know similar similar that kind of thing is that the environment of a squadron. So being involved in a um, whether it be Royal Air Force or the Army Air Corps or, or the Fleet Air Arm, which is the the kind of air force for the Navy, if you know what I mean. And we call it the Fleet Air Arm. And um, yeah, that that squadron life. You can imagine all the guys in the uh, in Red Squadron or any of the you know the squadrons of Star Wars having similar kind of um, you know similar banter crew room banter stuff and you know going out on you know regular sorties the, the training serials and that sort of thing that it's not really you're not you're having fun and you're enjoying the flying side and then when it's serious you know it can get serious quite quickly and and yeah it kind of uh yeah it's funny being and having that two sides to the same kind of thing really how did you find yourself in an x-wing cockpit I mean, I'm assuming at some point you actually did film some of that or at least around and around that. And, and how did that happen? Yeah, there was a few. So they basically, um, they've got an idea of what it is they're going to shoot in the, in the, in the films. Clearly there's a lot of the, the visual effects and the, um, special effects, visual effects side of things, um, where, the, the scenes, they know how the scenes are going to play out with the aircraft or the, the, the spacecraft um, flying around, but they can, they can do animation bits or computer bits where they, they have very rough aircraft flying around. And sometimes they need to see what the, um, the dialogue's going to be like or how it's going to work. And um, so they, they, asked us a, they asked a few of us on set, you know, who'd done acting prior and, um, you know, a number of us stuck our hands up who'd done... Um, roles of dialogue, uh, et cetera, without really knowing what it is they were going to be doing. And they took some of us to one side and did these sort of mini small auditions. And um, yeah, a, a couple of us, uh, me and Russell Ballard, in fact, who who's, uh, plays uh, Raylo Sorrell. Uh, he's a stuntman and a, a friend of mine anyway. Um, but we ended up jumping in a, a cockpit and being shot in various ways, doing some dialogue bits that the director was then kind of used to see how it would fit into the the, the main film sequences and stuff. Um, so that was one time in the cockpit, which was great, you know, brilliant having, doing some dialogue anyway and getting, um, you know, getting some direction and stuff. Um, but then there were other scenes where we had to run and scramble and jump in the cockpits and I had had to run in one and the, you know, the canopy all came down. It's part of a, quite a big scene actually. Um, and uh, so that, there's elements of that. There's some stuff in the background you can see for that. But, you know, obviously with films, so much gets shot and so much ends up on the on the cutting room floor, which you fully expect. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just being in the, jumping in and out of the cockpit. And we, we had a lot of the ground crew as well who were kind of assisting and putting the ladders up and, uh, you know, getting ready to take the, not the, quite the chocks because the thing doesn't necessarily roll in the same way, but, you know, they're putting the fuel in and all sorts of stuff in it. Yeah, it was very realistic, actually, um, from from my experiences. Forgive me if I'm waffling, by the way. <laughs> That's okay. Give me a sign to shut up. Just do that. Just a little, just a little, eh, yeah. eh, what's going on here? Oh, it looks like uh, John just left for a second, but uh, he'll be yeah, back yeah. in in just a second. There's always technical stuff that happens. Yeah, yeah. 
It's, it's Zoom, man. I'm telling you. I'm an educator. I deal with it with my students all the time. It always has something crazy happening. But um, Ben, let me ask you this, because um, every time I have somebody on who's been on the scene of a Star Wars film, has had the opportunity to work with Lucasfilm directly on any kind of project in particular, mm -hmm. um, the one question I always like to ask them, because there are so many people involved in these projects, for you yourself, being the ability to be an X-Wing pilot, have the experiences that you had. Was there one particular person on the, on like the set of Rogue One that was like your go-to to chat with, or just to even just have conversation with uh, during this, that time? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, so I, I as a part of the other kind of backstory, um, sure. I, I mentioned it before that I've uh, got um, an agency that I, I run as a, as my job or one of the, um, businesses that I run, sure. um, which is a, a background and specialist casting, it's like action casting agency. So I would worked with them and helped on set anyway as an advisor. So I'd been a, wow. advising on Rogue One, so helping the cast, um, you know, understand how the 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 ships might fly or the aircraft might fly. Right. They actually, the, the way that the helicopters fly and a lot of the the um, spacecraft in in these films you know that there's a lot of bits where they're taking off vertically and, and almost hovering and that kind of thing so there's a lot of similarities in the, the sort of dynamics of how the the, um, the ship fly um so yeah so I'd, I'd been advising on set anyway so i'd know quite a lot of the the personnel involved um in that sense some of the um assistant directors and again with the art department in terms of cockpit layout and that sort of thing um and and also, they'd um, they'd come to me to help try and get some other um, of the of the cast involved. It's like I said, the cast, the the background and um, you know specialist background roles. So there's a lot of well, there's a number of military pilots that were there, um, not necessarily who are fortunate enough to end up with um, with um, character names. Some have somewhere in the visual guide. I've got some some other Navy pilots who. Uh, who aren't necessarily in the film world or don't you know do a lot of the film side of things um so there was a lot there was lots of guys on set that i knew anyway um which was which was great because we were a lot of navy pilots all hanging around in that's right kit um <laughs> which, was, which was really good um which is great so yeah so i knew some of the the, the crew from the film side of things and then i knew a lot of the guys who were um, playing some of the roles which was uh, great as well well that familiarity i imagine was was something that was very welcomed being able to be on set and having those interactions for sure yeah yeah to the extent that um uh i, I did some work with jago luna for um in terms of his sort of knowledge of aircraft and right. again there's there's some flying scenes obviously where he's involved um and yeah, in, in sort of talking, in kind of the breaks in between scenes and stuff, we was chatting and found out that, because I used to live in Mexico City, mm. and I was actually living in Mexico the same time that he was out there. And we talked about this arcade that we used to play video game, you know, because obviously they didn't really have much. I had in television, you wanted to know about in television. Anyway, I had this in television, but most of the video games, there's a, there's this big mall in, in Mexico. We used to hang out in the same mall in the same time, the same era. Wow. With video games and this thing. So it's like, it's crazy. <laughs> and we got together on the set of Star Wars. And um, yeah, and he's obviously done great things. He's done some, some superb um, kind of low budget independent films all the way up to this one. So uh, wow. yeah, yeah, you get yeah, to um, meet, meet a lot of interesting people. Man, it's like a Han Solo line. Never tell me the odds, but man, that is a whole other situation yeah. right there. I mean, same mall, same video games. Woo! Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's mad. So we might say, yeah, we would possibly even cross paths over there. At some yeah. point. That'd be crazy. Well, welcome back, John. I know that your <laughs> your stuff got cut out there for a second. Yeah, welcome back to Earth, right? Uh, <laughs> I actually, I wanted to um, ask, and I hope I'm assuming you guys didn't speak about this. Is that the scene, the scene? No. And when you're you're standing behind Jen Urso and she's delivering what might be the most poignant speech in all of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. That I mean to be behind and around actors of that caliber 
creating a scene like that that must have been pretty in intense it was yeah and the um that the, obviously, obviously it's, it's well known that there were rewrites in the film as there as there always are you know this is you read about it afterwards and people say oh you know there's crisis on set you know something else is being reached it's like this is our film well, it's not crisis on set you know you 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 do have rewrites and you do reshoot things and you things don't quite work for some reason or there's a dialogue change or there's a little story twist and they have to change some dialogue so um, so it, it was shot a number of times that scene and um and each time it seemed to build in its intensity and its importance actually and um yeah and seeing the collection of some of the old uh you know faces from from the films that we'd seen anyway there it was just like wow this just does feel like it's important this feels you know uh, crucial and and critical and a real pinch point not f for this film but for all the films you know as you said it was just a key such a key speech and um yeah you know credit to the all the crew involved it they all it made it feel like it was like that you know it made it it, it felt that important and the, the cast and um you know felicity was just in, amazing uh she gave it just such intensity and, and importance to the role and, and to, to, that, to that to those lines as well yeah you knew that you were part of something when she was d delivering those lines it's like you know you, you get the like goosebumps or whatever you call them in the states you know like chills yeah it was superb to be part of that do you do you recall um you know exactly how everyone was coming together in those in those situations you know, did did the people in that moment know beforehand that that was going to be an important moment i mean the rest of you are all ready i'm sure to jump in your spaceships but yeah. um, here you are and you're having like this you know probably the most star warsy moment but it's in the in in a, in a ready room yeah yeah, so the um, we we knew because we'd we'd done as I said we'd done some of the dialogue before anyway. Not and not everyone can do the reshoots, so there's lots of people who aren't necessarily available, and they they have to reposition cameras and move people around. And so the the, the final uh, one that's on the screen was the one that was shot at the very end, obviously, or or, or to, towards the end of the shooting period. And so I'd, I'd done a lot of the scenes anyway, some of the running around, jumping in and out the cockpit and everything else and we we knew bits of st uh, you know the storyline anyway although a lot of it is kept clearly under wraps for everyone especially you know the, the background the supporting guys um but yeah when the, the first few lines are delivered and they're they'd said the assistant directors had, had made it really clear that this was just a really key point and the importance of it and they give backstories you know they say okay, here's the setting this is why it's so important you know they'll, they'll say some you know some people here are just aghast at this some people are um you know fearing for their lives you know this could be the you're talking about weapons of mass destruction of on a scale you know on a galactic scale <laughs> it's, you know like this is important for all you guys and yeah you, you get into it you're in the kit you've got the you know these big actors these big hollywood actors here this is a big deal you know and and then when they roll the cameras up and kind of shove them in your face yeah you you you're, you're in it you, you feel like you're part of it yeah. Um, yeah the uh the the speaking of big hollywood actors uh i had seen various still shots of people who are dressed up like bigs and porkins uh in your yeah. squadron in the movie yeah. Were, right. were they on set? Were there people who were supposed to look like some of the original? Yeah, it's funny you say that. I'm, and I don't, you know, it's, the film's gone past by enough now that it doesn't matter me talk, you know, talking openly about it. But yeah, they, they were really keen on that kind of legacy um, actors. And they had, they had a number of people picked out who would look similar, you know, who would look good. And there were, there were some that looked really good. And they, um, they they had the kit and the helmet and they they had all those helmets labeled up separately for these guys to make sure that you know the kit and the helmets were all going to be absolutely bang on you know they didn't want to be making mistakes um on that front um so yeah they were they were around um uh, i know one of them 
Yeah, one of them was actually an ex-Navy guy who didn't know that he was going to be pulled up. No, no, he was serving Navy at the time. He, he didn't know that he was, that was what he was going to be asked to do. Wow. And so they whisked him off, hair and makeup, extra photos, and and he came back, you know, with it all on. And we're like, whoa, that, that is, it was actually Biggs. He was, he was looking just like, yeah. Um, was there a little, little jealousy? Because you already have the mustache. <laughs> yeah, I already had the money. I'm, I'm six foot five or whatever, and you know, I, yeah. I said no. You know, they offered it to, but I. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so there were those guys, but um, it, it was kind of obvious that they weren't going to make a big deal of it. It wasn't like they wanted to, you know, be parading these this character or that character around. I think they were keen to give it a go, and if it worked. And if they looked right, they would probably use it and use the cuts and everything else. But I think in the final film, you're not really meant to see or meant to believe that there's any one of those of the background guys necessarily. Um, but yeah, they, they would. I remember seeing they had um, you know all the pictures of legacy guys up in the um, uh, in the hair and makeup section. You know they had Biggs, Porkins, and whoever else, you know all the others in there. But I think what they're working on, though, was to fill in some of the other gaps uh, of the pilots in A New Hope that you didn't see and didn't know. They wanted to give names and faces to some of the other people that you knew were characters, but we hadn't seen these guys or, or heard about them. So um, I think that was something that they wanted to do. They had mentioned it kind of early on, I remember that. So, And again, I'm sure that was a... That's probably a Gareth thing. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we, yeah, yeah. could see the guys? And... It's very true. Yeah, I think um, for for some of us who suddenly appeared in the because we didn't, you know, we didn't know we we were taken out um, and and scanned, you know, for the full the full three hundred and sixty scanning and the um, extra. They do extra super high def pictures of you in case you needed for anything else ever, CGI or, or otherwise. Um, and you know, if anyone has used four things like the books, the visual guide, and there's a couple of other books that you stick a books and things and you find stuff in. So they were doing hero shots of of a bunch of us. Um, and we knew that there was we knew that there was character elements involved, but we didn't know if you'd be in the film or if you'd be in you know, appearing elsewhere until the visual guide came out and that was when it was uh um like wow okay so they've <laughs> like it's like me and russell and some of the other guys i know it's just like wow they've given us call signs and names and like places in the canon of star wars it's, it's a big deal you know uh, i mean i told my kids i said you know i'm I'm interviewing Red Seven, and, and and I said, Jack, do you remember the man who was standing behind Jen Urso in the in the speech room? He said, Oh yeah. Yeah. So you know, and then it, it was fun because um, this continuity, we we just interviewed Gold Leader, um, and uh, my my boss, one of my bosses. <laughs> yeah, and he was saying how great it was that the two films connected so solidly. And yeah. He had seen he had seen a cut where somebody had lopped the um end off of rogue one and and put it on to the beginning of uh star wars a new hope and yeah. that it was just so seamless and i i think for all of the film's success i think that that seamless nature and the ability to watch those two films back to back almost as a 1a and 1b um is what makes it so special to me yeah totally and and again you know down to the when when I first got approached to help with the, some of the, um, the the casting of the pilots and aircrew, obviously through my experience and and, and advising etc., you know they were treating it. I think they even called it. You know this is a period drama. Sorry, it's uh, uh, my phone going off. Yeah, the theme song to Karate Kid is my uh, ringtone. You're the best around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, the um, when we were first involved, they, they were calling it period drama. You know, they said this is a it's a period piece because it's not like seventies. We want everyone with tashes and looking ridiculous seventies, but they wanted that seamless nature so that everyone 
you know, sideburns are slightly long. It's not the fact that it's, it was made in, you know, it was made back then, but it's out in the, wherever it is in a galaxy far, far away. So, um, you know, the, the, the look and feel of it had to be of that of the kind of, it had to have a 70s kind of feel to it or taste to it. And, um, and that's part of that seamless thing. They wanted that in, interconnectivity. Some of the, the droids that are there in the background. I mean, some the, the guys there that you didn't even see in the, um, uh, in the final film, there were droids from the first film that I guess some of the fans would know exactly, you know, they'd spot them in books or whatever else. But, you know, they're so keen to have this, this tie in. And then when we all saw it, you know, when we went to... Um, to watch it when it first screened in Leicester Square. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of us, actually, uh, some Navy guys, we all got suited and booted and went down there and, uh, you know, our, our dicky bows and uh, with a few beers in, not having any clue what the film was going to be like, you know, who's, who's going to win it, if anyone was going to make the final cut or whatever. But just that last scene, just... Or I did just like anyone else, like you guys as well, I'm sure. Um, you know, how it segues in, it's just like, wow, these guys, they could not have done that any better. There's no, there's no two ways about it. You know, if you'd have written, rewritten that and shot that 20 times over, you would not get a better kind of finale segue into the, you know, to, to mash us back into the, the universe that we all know. Mm. I mean, Princess Leia was my first love. And yeah. so to, to finish, uh, to finish the, the film, and I, I believe she had just passed. Yeah. Um, and so to see Leia back, it was comforting in a way that was I, I was not expecting. Mm. But also that continuity of the, you know, that there is hope, that things will get better, that, you know, you can watch um something that's inspirational that is a fantasy and, and those things are i think very important especially now when many of us don't have time to read books and many of us are not having the ability to you know, you know for instance when's the last time anyone sat down that you know to read tolkien cover to cover yeah, you yeah, know yeah. but we can watch star wars you know a couple hours after the kids go to bed which is incredibly helpful when you're having a bad day and uh you know um, yeah. and then you know of course we have the ability to see some of the shows that they do in between you know like you were on the star wars show yeah. Uh, yeah. and it, was it you showing pablo around or was pablo showing you around the set <laughs> yeah, i was i was showing pablo around it was great because I'd, I'd met him uh i've met him before we did the little bit of interview and had a chat and he was kind of interested in you know my the backstory the the, the flying and stuff I didn't realize, I mean, I I'd heard the name before, but I didn't realize that it's like, you know, part of that story group that decided kind of everything where all the ties go in and, and the threads, you know, it's a difficult task, isn't it? Picking all the threads of this universe and trying to tie them all in together. Um, but uh, yeah, and then we just had a really just fun chat. And then after we stopped, um, after the, the camera stopped rolling and whatever else, Again, we just carried on chatting anyway about all things Star Wars. You know, he's obviously uh, knows his knows his stuff. <laughs> he's pretty uh, pretty into it all, which is great. Wow, that's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible that you had that opportunity with uh, Pablo there. And I think the one thing with Rogue One too that stands out to me, Ben. This is kind of my last point to you on, on this, and maybe a question involved in in that is that you know Gareth had such an amazing crew behind him, the Pablo Hidalgos. Um, the Gary Wittas, I mean, Gary, what he did with some of the novelizations that came even before Rogue One, if you read Catalyst, I mean, there's just so many different intricate parts of this canon that involve themselves into Rogue One and then yeah. into A New Hope, like we talked about. Now, for you, when it comes to the Star Wars universe now, you wanted to, you had the opportunity maybe to play Biggs, you get the mustache, get the hair, get everything else. Yeah. Is there that one character, though, in the Star Wars universe for you if you had an opportunity to either through the sequel trilogy, original trilogy, look back and be like, it'd been cool to play that character. Is there somebody that sticks out to you? Ah, oh, God, that's a good question. Um, that's a great question. I mean, I, 
things i was at, i was at an age where even though the um empire strikes back was clearly an amazing film and dark and it just sort of sucked you in right. at that age i was a return of the jedi guy you know because i'm that age and um you know looking back at it it's just like Gee, I don't, maybe it's not quite as cool as i remember <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many kind of characters in that i mean um since obviously since uh solo is out now you know lando is just like the coolest yeah kid in town and um and anything where he pops up you're just like i don't know i'm, I'm just trying to think of the whole that era i'm flashing back to when i was a kid and um yeah it'll be something return of the jedi i mean obviously everyone you know hans the the guy everyone's he's right. just the guy isn't he <laughs> yeah. I, I, I should say I um I subsequently I don't know if I mentioned it but I, I got to work on solo as well. Mm. Oh really? As the aviation advisor and um oh, wow. so the my my role on that one was to uh, be teaching the, the the best pilot in the galaxy how to fly. So I worked with <laughs> Alden and uh, and Jonas oh, on yeah. basically inside the the cockpit the Falcon, uh, teach them how to to fly and to go through the flying sequences with the uh, and yeah, Henry Davis, who, who's a uh, uh, an ex-pilot colleague of mine. He's a director, a um, film writer, director, and producer uh, now. But um, yeah, I, I there was on the first day. So I'd, I'd worked with them on on the other craft for a, a few weeks. And it was the first day I was going to be um, going onto the into Falcon, and I wasn't able to do it because um, of some other work I was doing. So I phoned up. My, my friend Henry and, and said, look, can you, um, can you do me a favor? I got this job thing. And he was like, man, I'm just so busy with this uh, film I'm doing. I was like, oh, geez, uh, no worries. He goes, you know, what was it? I said, oh, no. well, it's advising, you know, it's using, because we used to fly, you know, we were pilots together on the same squadron, on the same ship. Uh, and I said, well, you know, you can't tell anyone, but it's, uh, it's working. It's basically in the Falcon. T and he was like, I'm good. I'm there. I'm flying. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and Bournemouth, so he had to like fly up just for a day, you know, literally, um, you know, f flew up stra uh, straight away and was, yeah, on the job. So, yeah, did an awesome job. But yeah, so, sorry, I was just going on to that just because of oh. talking about, you know, Han Solo being the guy and, um, yeah, yeah, but he's probably the, he's probably the one. Yeah. Obviously, I, I couldn't play him, but... <laughs> <laughs> Indiana Jones, you know, just you know, boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would have been someone in the uh, yeah in the cantina, probably in the background. Hey, I, 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 the idea that you have a call sign and your own ship, and that you actually made it through the Battle of Scarif. Yeah, that, I mean, that's it. Yeah, the, mean, yeah, totally. The fact that the yeah, I can watch and you hope now, <laughs> and one of the ships going because you do actually hear you hear. Uh, I think Red Seven, uh, yeah. Red Seven standing by. I think. But yeah, just seeing one of the ships and be like, I'm in one of those, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Do, um, now, you said, I, I want to say that you, for a while there, or maybe you currently do, you had a, a company that was helping um, mm. ex-military uh, get into movies when, when necessary. Is that still what you do now, or what do you got going on? That's right, yeah. I mean, obviously, the film industry at the moment in current times is um, is completely shut i mean they're slowly films are coming back again but yeah that's uh it's uh, mfs casting um and uh we it's a lot of we sort of move into a lot of action so it's not just um military guys even though we are specifically known for the for the military side uh but there's ex uh, uh police or ambulance or there are some guys who do you know fights stuff or their um sport side of things you know so when there's action um involved uh yeah we get to to help cast you know some of the supporting roles some background roles um but uh, yeah it's been it's been really interesting we've had some i should mention because we worked on um on the king's man um oh. so yeah september 18th is the it's the launch date of the film obviously the trailer's out if anyone's into kings and films they should uh yeah, check out the trailer. It looks great. Wow. That's a quick plug because we were... <laughs> oh, no, we, yeah. That's actually one of our things. We always do the quick plug here at the end. So. Yeah, 
the franchise is, uh, you know, it's, it's just such good fun. It, it, you know, fantasy fun just to remove you from uh, kind of reality of, of stuff and just enjoy, you know, uh, a, a great great bit of action. So yeah, we've had a lot of guys on on um, on a lot of those Kingsman films, and um, yeah, terrific fun to work on. And it's going to be a real great one. This one, it really is. There, there's, they pull, you know, there's they pull out all the stops on it. So it's going to be, um, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Anyway, trailer out now for the Kingsman. Look at that. That's one of the best plugs we've had so far, John. I like uh, it. It's, it's yeah. you know, hey, yeah, I'm, you know, I worked on the Kingsman, you know, <laughs> <laughs> little, little humble brag, you know. <laughs> how, about, how, how about you, John? Let's wrap this up. Let's uh, have you do your plug. Oh, well, I'll be writing about uh, Benjamin Hartley. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll be on uh, with uh, stories about uh, Gold Leader and, uh, and Red 7 here on, uh, well, first of all, we'll have the videos, but we'll also have stories over at mickeyblog.com. Awesome. awesome. Brilliant. And uh, you guys can follow me over on Twitter at Mr. Vote Tweets. Check out the Brick City Blockade podcast, of course, on YouTube and over on Twitter at Brick City SWPC for continual conversations across the board about everything happening, not just in the fandom, but in the galaxy far, far away as well. Uh, you can rock the network. You can support the network over on Patreon, uh, the network of uh, really cool shows that we got going on here. Great conversations like this that you're watching right now uh, from the Brick City Blockade. So please make sure to check it out. But Ben, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on, my friend. Great. Thank you, Robin. It's been really good fun. I've enjoyed chatting with you guys. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, hey, it's not a podcast until we say this either. Right, John? Uh, bring it. May the force be with you. Always. Hang on with